Suppose you knew, I mean really knew, that this week to come would be the last week of your life. Now, we talked about this a little bit last week when we were talking about the second coming of Christ. What if you knew that Jesus was coming at the end of the week? That is one way that our lives might end, if that's the way God is going to do things. Um, there are other ways that life might end. Um, what if we knew that a week from now we were going to die? That sounds like an execution, doesn't it, if we knew that? Um, what, if, what if we knew that a week from now? that God would take us up into heaven the way he did with Enoch in Genesis 5 and the way he did with Elijah in 2 Kings 2. What if we, and I think some people call that being translated to heaven. That's an interesting word to me. But what if we knew that a week from right now would be the end of our lives? If you knew that about your life, would you eat steak every night? <laughs> Maybe every meal. Would you have shrimp and lobster and filet mignon? Would you eat a half gallon of ice cream for dessert every meal with a side kicker of a pound of chocolate, for that matter? Would you buy food for everyone or, or gifts uh, for everyone? Of course, you'd put it all on your credit card. <laughs> it may be that somehow you knew that it would be the end of your life very soon. How would that change the way you spent your time? Would you connect with old friends? Uh, and family members that maybe you hadn't seen in decades. I have some cousins like that. Might even have an aunt or uncle around that that I haven't talked to in a long time. Are there some people that you would ask forgiveness of or that you would approach to tell them that they hurt you and that you would like them to ask for forgiveness or at least acknowledge your pain? How would your life be different if you knew that a week from now that your life on earth as you know it would be dead? Would you, would you finally try to tell some people, or try to tell some people finally, however that sentence works, about Jesus? Would you, would you think about it, pray about it? Would you, would you make a list? Would you check it twice? Would you try to find out who's naughty or, well, anyways. You know, when, when time seems limitless, there's no urgency when time seems limitless, we feel like, you know, it, we don't have to do that today or tomorrow. And today and tomorrow usually turn into months, years, decades. And I've had people that I intended to tell about Jesus, and then I hear that they've passed away. Opportunity missed. Now, I don't know if they would have received Jesus. Was that my justification? I, I sure hope not. I know better than to, to do that. Because we don't know who's going to accept Christ. We don't know who's going to want to receive him. Would we want to bring as many of our friends to heaven with us? Well, it's not necessarily true that their life is going to end next week. That might add some urgency for them as well. Um, would we check our religion, quote unquote, to make sure everything's okay between us and God? I suspect we would. I suspect that we would really... Um, rack our brains about any unconfessed sin or uh, give words of repentance about things that we did that had kind of become habits and uh, things that we're not sure that God would be pleased with. Maybe we'd like to stand before God and have him say, well, you know, you did this one thing all those years, but boy, you sure got it right that last week. Something, right? If this were the last week of your life here on earth, might you cram a bit? You know, like, like back in high school days or even college days when, you know, you did an all-nighter studying for that big test? Would you, would you read the Bible? Would you uh, kind of familiarize yourself again with a few passages that you think might impress the Lord? Maybe we'd be a little bit like W.C. Fields, and some of you might remember W.C. Fields. Some of you are Googling him right now. Um, he was a, a well-known, at least agnostic, if not atheist. And apparently he was on what was thought to be his deathbed, and a friend came in and saw him reading the Bible. And the friend said, uh, what are you doing? And W.C. Fields, with a familiar voice tone, <laughs> said, looking for loopholes. I don't think he found any. 
Well, we have an opportunity to look at our lives as having urgency, having importance to God and to others. What did Jesus do? I know that uh, there are different bracelets that people have worn and even t-shirts or whatever, hats. You know, WWJD, what would Jesus do? But some have worn, what did Jesus do? And we know what Jesus did for a lot of the last week of his life. Um, and, and if you want to look at it this way, the last week started about on Sunday. Um, we could look back to the, to the Friday before, and there are some things that happened there most likely. But, but let's start on Sunday. Um, call it Palm Sunday, as we would call it today, which of course was yesterday on the church calendar. Um, but Jesus knew how long he had, and he knew how the week would end. He knew that there would be much pain, that there would be confrontation and conflict, and there would just be things that were going to happen in his life that had purpose because he made sure that he was doing God's will and accomplishing God's purpose. Well, we're going to look at the last week of Jesus' life through John's eyes. Uh, I believe all four of the Gospels talk about the triumphal entry. And again, that's the Palm Sunday story, Jesus riding on a, a donkey or a colt or whatever, and uh, people putting their, their coats down and palm branches or whatever kind of tree branches in front of him uh, to smooth the road. And the, the part that kind of got my attention here is that Jesus is entering Jerusalem like a hero. And the people were looking at him that way. As a matter of fact, this passage says that the people knew about him raising Lazarus back to life and that they were celebrating that as much as anything else. I also think that they were kind of tired of the religious leaders and their hypocrisy and, and the way that, that they were demanding and, and, and selfish and, and just they, they wanted power and money and, and, and everything that they could have. They wanted people to bow down to them. And we don't see that in Jesus. If you want to say Jesus was, was uh, a man of the people, that's fine. But more than that, he was a man of the Father, a man of God. And, and the people knew that they needed something more. Well, another part that gets my attention here in John chapter 12, 12 and 13. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Well, they've kind of taken him where he hasn't taken himself to call him the King of Israel. He was the son of David, but he was not looking for a royal throne on this earth. He even says later on, my kingdom is not of this world. But it's this idea of the hero's welcome, Hosanna. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I, I hope that people look at us that way, not as a hero, but as a person who lives the message that we proclaim. People who, who have an understanding of God and want to help others and not just be Lord over them, small l or capital for that matter. So Jesus had his triumphal entry and, and he came into Jerusalem. Well, later down in chapter 12, we see that he predicted his own death. Take a, a look at John 12, 23 through 27. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now remember, he had said many times that his hour, his hour had not yet come. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. Anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. A few verses down. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, Jesus says, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. 
So he compares himself to a kernel of wheat. Now, when they harvest the wheat, they do two things with it. Most of it, they bring into the barns. They bring into the, the threshing floor. They have to get that dried grass, uh, the chaff off it. So it's more usable to them and, and does what it's supposed to do and tastes good. But they take some of it and put it aside to be seed for next year. And I don't know what they look for and what kind of the seeds are, are put aside or whatever. But Jesus says that he is like the seed. That he is going to be taken and then put in the ground. And then a fruit is produced. A result is produced that is what the farmer wants, what the farmer needs, what the community wants and needs. And that's what Jesus is doing, that he is that kernel of wheat that surrenders, if you will, uh, that dies and produces many other seeds. Jesus could have saved his own life. He said, I could call thousands of angels. He didn't. Why? That would not have been God's will. It would not have been God's plan. It would not have done the things that God wanted to do through him. And so Jesus became that kernel of wheat. He also is the one who is lifted up. And he shows them how just days later that he is going to be lifted up. In other words, put on a cross, you know, hung on a pole, uh, <laughs> whatever. There, there are different ways to, to translate those words. But he shows that he knows what he's doing. And he is willing to do it. He's willing to surrender his life to make sure that, that he can. And in verse 32, he talks about drawing all people to himself. Now, some were drawn to him in horror. Some of them were revulsed by what happened. It was a, a grisly, gruesome thing. But people could be drawn to the Father through him. His attention, and this goes to his purpose, the attention that he received was intended to point to the Father and point us to the Father. How very, very important that is. So Jesus predicted his death. Uh, uh, by the way, a, a passage that really points out a lot is in Romans chapter 5, because Paul wrote that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly while we were still sinners. And it's interesting because he says, you know, someone might die for a good man. No one would die for a righteous man. In other words, self-righteous. But while we were sinners, Jesus died for us. And so he came and, and, and fulfilled God's purpose, made sure that the right thing was done. Well, let's go to John 13. John 13, 1 through 9 because Jesus washed their feet. And my understanding is that, that this is kind of in the same uh, upper room, same time frame as, as the Last Supper. And there are interesting things that happen here where he tells Judas that he knew Judas was going to betray him. And he tells Peter that he knew Peter would deny him. And, and uh, they have a big argument over who's the greatest and that kind of thing. Oh my, how strange. Well, John 13, 1 through 9. It was just before the Passover. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave the world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he had come from God and was returning to him. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After he had poured water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Well, he comes to Simon Peter, and Peter says, Oh, no, Lord, you're not going to do that. Peter was strangely uh, over the top on some of these things. And Jesus tells him why it's important. And then Peter says, Well, not just my feet, wash my whole... No, no, Peter, no. No. And so Jesus shows them what it means to be a servant. He shows them that he is able to humble himself and to lift them up. He, he took the role of a servant. Have you ever washed someone's feet? And I'm not talking about your own. That might be gross too. No, have you ever, as part of a, uh, if you want to call it a religious ceremony, as part of a religious activity, wash someone's feet? I have. 
I've had my feet washed. Honestly, I'd rather wash someone's feet than have someone wash my feet. It's not that my feet are that evil or whatever, but it's, it's humbling. Now, it's humbling when you wash someone's feet, but more so when your feet are washed is what I've experienced at least. I, th I think it would be good for many churches to periodically have foot washing ceremonies. Now, there are other mentions of foot washing in the New Testament, but it's not like a church-wide thing. It's not given as, as something that we're commanded to do or even an example of doing in, in very many cases at least. But for us to be a servant and to be humble and to lift up others, I mean, here's Jesus. Here is Jesus washing their feet, the Lord of heaven and earth, the creator of the universe, washing their feet. Oh, my. Well, when Jesus had finished washing their feet, verses 12 through 15, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Now, is that intended to be a command for us to do? It, it, there, there's no reason not to, other than our own pride or our sense of time. You know, oh, it would take so long to do that in the church. Eh, whatever. We need to get past that. But it's knowing that that we can humbly serve others even without them taking their shoes and socks off or us getting a towel and a basin of water. But there are other ways that we serve people, but so often we don't. We don't make good use of that. Well, next we have the Last Supper. And in John 13, 18 through 30, it kind of looks like the, the supper portion of the program there. Luke chapter 22, Jesus talks about the bread representing his body about the cup representing his blood. He talks about the new covenant. He also gives them comfort in distress. And uh, John chapter 14, we're familiar with that passage. Uh, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that where I am going to prepare a place for you, uh, uh, have I, uh, would I have told you all right, if that were not so, I would have told you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back, take you to be with me, that you may be where I am. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Well, he gives comfort to them. Now, it should be a time that he's in distress. This is just hours before they're going to go out to the garden and he's going to be arrested and put on trial and whatever, but he's giving them comfort. We need to look past ourselves and give others comfort as well. In John 17, he prays. And I want you to notice here the three parts of his prayer. Verses one through five, he prays for himself. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. Uh, Jesus knew he was going to the cross. It would be soon. He knew there was pain. During this time, he's sweating drops of blood. Um, he's calling out to his disciples. Why can't you wait with me? He's saying, you know, Lord, you know, Father, if there's any way for this cup to pass from me, but not my will, your will be done. Verses 6 through 19, he prays for his disciples. He prays for the people who are right there around him, <laughs> sleeping for the most part. But he prays for them. And he prays asking that the Father would help them. Uh, he, he prays that, that they will have strength and that they would be protected from the evil one. And how important that is. He doesn't pray for them not to have problems. They do. Most of them would be put to death for their faith. But they remain faithful. The last portion, verses 20 through 26, he prays for us. He prays for you and he prays for me. My prayer, verse 20 says, is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. So Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost with the twelve. And they preached and people believed over 3,000 were baptized into Christ that day. And then the message went out from there. Eventually they went to Samaria. Eventually they went to, to the Gentiles. Eventually they went to the other side of the world. Eventually Christians were on every continent on the face of the earth. And that message has carried down and there have been religious wars and all kinds of problems and conflicts. And eventually the message carried down 
to you and to me. And I give God praise for a preacher named Larry Smith. And I, I know a little bit about his spiritual history and his mentors and people who helped him and the school that he went to and they trained him and, and, and others who have had an impact to help others be one to Christ. I've had the privilege myself of baptizing people into Christ and to help them to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And so Jesus is praying for them and us and everyone. He continues to pray. Now, verse 21 he prays that we may be one, unified. That way people would know that we belong to him. We would give a testimony. Why aren't we one? Why aren't we one body as we're supposed to be? Verse 23, he talks about how unity would show that we are loved by the Father. Unity is kind of like being one, isn't it? Verse 26 says, we must have the love of Jesus in us so that the world will know that they are loved too. If all you can do is complain and grumble about people in your church and what your church does and doesn't do and, you know, how did they do this and why didn't they do that and, and all of this, then you're not being a good representative of Christ and his body. Get over yourself. Get on board with Jesus Help him to work in us so that we may be one and so that the world would see the love of Christ in us. The end of, of our message today is John 18, Jesus is arrested. We'll pick up here next week. I, I hope and pray that you have a great week this week and that you'll consider the things that Jesus went through and how your life would be different if we took seriously the potential end of life as we know it in this, in this world. Thank you, Father, for blessing us with your, your message from your word. Thank you, Father, for Jesus who has shown us how to walk more humbly with you, to share your love. Help us, Father, to be one. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you and have a great Monday.